few questions in the in the chat that um... yes so uh uta seidler had a question concerning the connection of the bayesian approach and classical regularization in what sense is the solution regularized and can we control the regularity of the quantity of interest by the choice of the prior yeah sure thank you um yeah so m maybe since i am in the consistency part i'm going to explain um the relationship between the Bayesian and variational regularization. Um, we will talk more about it then. I, I just um, here say that um, if you consider the like likelihood, um, rho eta that we were mentioning so much, uh, uh, we were referring to it, um, that is sort of related to uh least a square um minimization without the regularization okay and then when that gets multiplied by the prior if you think of the density if the likelihood then uh, get multiplied by the by the density of the priors think of finite dimensional case then that would work like a, a regularization uh, you are adding something extra to list the square minimization, sort of. In that sense, it, it has a connection with the regularization in the um, uh, variational case. But I, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in more detail in the consistency part. Um, okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. But there were some titles I think people had uh, mentioned that that caused some confusion. Um, if I can find it, uh, yeah. Somebody was talking about a smaller case n somewhere. Uh, maybe in this slide I had made a mistake here. That was the source of confusion. Um, so this is supposed to be capital N. I think it has been Hengrui who has was asked this. I'm not sure if this was the point. The confusion was between a uh, small case N and uh, the capital G. Capital uh, J, yes, that's right. J. Yeah, but a small N is, I meant capital N here in this slide that you are looking, I hope I hadn't used it somewhere else in a wrong way. And this is different <laughs> from capital J. J, capital J is the uh, count of data, the total number of data. This is the regularization. Um, uh, sorry, this is the discretization parameter N for the. And then I thought maybe it's useful uh, since someone had said, um, so his confusion for the little n is in the next few slides. All right. Uh, oh. oh, like here. Sorry, it might be your. Uh, uh, yeah. That, that. Yes. 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 He says it's. It's there. Okay. Yes. Uh, all right. Thank you. Yes. Yes. They are. Uh, they, they have the same role here. Sorry for the um, change of notation now. Little n here is the number of data. Yeah, absolutely. 
but I wanted to also make this clear because somebody had said that there was um, they didn't understand this the stuff that we talked about on the expectation of these functionals. I'm I'm gonna maybe have a go at trying to make it more clear. Maybe with this uh, PDE problem. Um, so if I have a Fourier expansion of U, so the Fourier coefficients of uh, U in this basis, sorry, J or U J. And if you have the full Fourier series, you have the full um, function U. Now, suppose that you consider an approximation of u, you call it u superscript n, and this is formed by the first n members um, of the expansion of u. So j equals 1 to capital N. Now, if you consider this un in the PDE instead of u, then you would get an approximated p, which we call pn, right? And then you can ask, what is the difference between pn and p? And this, we showed before that the L-infinity norm is Lipschitz in U. Okay, so if, for example, I have u minus un less than or equal n to the power of minus alpha, let's say, then pn and p also would be def different with the same rate. So it would be c n to the power of minus alpha. Okay. Now this p comes from the solution of the PDE and that is what gives you y, okay, or in other words, this is plus the noise. This is the forward operator G applied to UN, PN. So I write it here. PN is the forward operator G applied to UN, and P is G applied to U. So therefore, putting all of this together, we know that phi and phi n also converge to each other with the same rate. Okay. Phi being the uh, log likelihood, negative log likelihood, because it's just a continuous function of this g. Okay. Right, so, so far I have this. If I consider u n the first n uh, uh, formed by the first n Fourier coefficient of u, then I would have a phi n which approximates phi with the same rate that u approximates, uh, u n approximates u. And then we have proved that this then implies that new n corresponding to phi n approximate new in the Hellian distance with the same rate. Okay. Okay, now keep that. And then, you know, when we are extracting information from posterior, we are calculating expectations of functionals. So when I write, so I would like to approximate the expectation of um, different functions under mu by the same functions under mu n. And by this expectation, of course, I just mean the integral of this f over the space x. Uh, 
but that's the that's my definition of my expectation and then having d hellinger bounded by cn to the power of minus alpha by what i have shown you before you can look it up later this approximation of the expectation this is what i am interested to calculate but i can not calculate it exactly i have to approximate so i am in in practice i am calculating this one and then this is saying that this is good enough because then by the result that we have this is also approximating the expectation and the, the true expectation with this with this error so if uh, you choose n large enough then your um, approximation of the expectation would be good enough Okay, so I think I'll move on now to the next uh, part. Um, so I'm going to talk about consistency of the posterior. Um, so here the setting is, is like this. Here um, we assume that there is an underlying truth that we call um, u dagger here and then um, the data is coming from that underlying truth um, right so my data is the application of this forward operator plus some noise as before and i have n pieces of data sorry for the change of notation little n is now the number of data um, and if each each y j itself can be living in some Euclidean space, um, R k. All right. The um, noise I'm fixing to be Gaussian again uh, with uh, this um, covariance matrix. Um, so I'm repeating making these measurements. Okay. We have one vector of measurements, RK, let's say at points X1 to XK, if you think, think of the elliptic problem, and let's say I keep repeating it, that can be one way of extracting so many data, or I can go ahead and just take data from different, um, different locations, of course I can do. Um, okay, now, If I consider Gaussian prior, based on what we have um, shown, the posterior, given this n pieces of data, would have this red and nicotine derivative with respect to the prior. Right. Here, of course, I, I mentioned that mu naught in is, is Gaussian. I will consider it for this part to be Gaussian. But for defining this, uh, it really doesn't make a difference what mu naught is. The likelihood is defined like that because the um, um, noise this has this density. And you have n pieces of data. You have n pieces of data. Okay. Um, now the question that we ask is the following. As I am keeping uh, making more and more measurement, does this posterior measure, the one given by the expression here, does it concentrate on the smaller and smaller neighborhoods around this truth? Um, 
So it's shrinking around truth. That's that would be the ideal scenario. Um, and with which rate is doing so? Um, so this is the main. Uh, this is what is asked when people are talking about posterior consistency. We are going to uh, concentrate on a much simpler question. We are going to say. Um, if I look at the most likely function under this um, posterior, does that one convert to the truth? Okay. So the so-called weak consistency. And along the way, we will see, the, uh, of course, uh, connection between uh, this Bayesian and variation of classical regularization that was also the subject of the question we had. Okay, so I first need to uh, make sense of the modes of the posterior, the most likely functions, the most likely element under the posterior measure. Now, if you are in a finite dimensional space, then we have level density, and therefore mu naught has level density, and mu has level density, which would be just the density of uh, mu naught times the density of mu with respect to mu naught, which is the log likelihood which is the likelihood, sorry. Uh, right, so as soon as you have the density, then you can say, okay, I'm uh, looking then for the point which maximizes this density, this would be my mode. Now in the form that we have it here for the, uh, this example of Gaussian um, prior and the way that we have represented the likelihood, then this is equivalent to minimizing this functional i. So if I minimize this, I obtain my um, the, the modes of the posterior. Now here um, you can see um, how the prior is acting as a regularizer. So Notice that mu naught has this uh, distribution, this Gaussian distribution. So C naught is the covariance matrix for the Gaussian in this finite dimensional setting. So this term here is due to um, the prior appearing in this functional I. If, if this didn't exist there, you were only minimizing phi with respect to u. And remember, if you have Gaussian noise, this looks like this. Gamma being the covariance of the noise. So your, your mode would be the least a square estim estimator which of course might not be unique and all that. The term, the second term in the right hand side is added because of the prior and this is exactly what we know as the regularization term in the classical theory. Okay. Now, when X is a function space, um, of course, you don't, you don't have any Lebesgue density, so I cannot write a density like that for mu. Uh, so I cannot uh, rigorously define my modes like that, so I need to define them topologically. Or oh, not that I need to, I mean they can be defined topologically. So I'm going to first define them like that and then uh, show that they also end up giving us a um, variation of formulation. Okay. 
So if I have um, my quantity of interest in a separable Banach space, I have a measurement amount that charges x with probability one, then I can, uh, and sorry, this is a measure, uh, here I am only talking about a, a generic measure, sorry, let's call it mu. We will, it will be later or uh, posterior, of course, but here I, I am only telling you how you can define the modes of a given measure mu if you have a, a function space. Okay, so what, how we do it topologically, we take a ball of radius epsilon and we move it in a space X um, to find the uh, point or points which give us the maximum probability for this ball. Okay. Right. This is what happens in the numerator here. And then we repeat this for a smaller and a smaller radius of this ball, and then see if these centers converge to any uh, members, mem any member or members of the um, space um, X. So if such a member exists, call it U tilde here, uh, then that would be our mode. Um, equivalently, you can think of it like this. So you have uh, a ball at U tilde. If it, if it is a uh, mode of your posterior, if you, moved, if you move anywhere else, this limit uh, would result in a value less than or equal one. So you would have your maximal probability already in U tilde. So you are defining your mode as limit of the proportion of such bars like this. All right, now this is the topological definition, but of course, for calculational purposes, we would like to have this like the way we have in the finite dimensional case as a minimization problem. But to do that, we ask this limit of proportion of balls that shows itself there, can it be represented as some function of U and V, the centers of the ball? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, when you have density, when you are in Rn, and you have such a function easily defined over the whole space Rn, um, but when X is a function space, that is not the case. And uh, on the whole space X, what you have is a subspace on which a very smooth subspace of X for which you can define um, the function F, seeing in that relation stuff. Now this Z is a small under your measure mu. So this mu is the measure you want to find the mode of. Um, in the sense that a space Z has um, measure zero um, under mu. Um, so showing that unlike the uh, finite dimensional case, it's not uh, immediately obvious to see that you can relate this to the minimizers of F. So as I said, the minimizers of these functions, this function F or I, as we have defined it like that here, um, this function, this functional I can be defined for some subspace. But 
remember that your me your measure mu is living on the whole space x, and you really it's not immediately obvious that your modes are gonna be members of this subspace z. Okay, um, they might be outside it a priori. That's the that's the thing that you need to rule out. Okay? Right, so let's go back to our Bayesian setting and assume that we have the radionuclide and derivative of mu with respect to mu naught, a nice Gaussian measure centered at zero. So the mode of mu naught, of course, we know where it is. It's at the origin of the space. Um, and the radionuclide and derivative of mu with respect to mu naught is given to us. Right. Now, if the function phi is Lipschitz, is locally Lipschitz, then um, the modes are indeed characterized by the minimizers of the function um, that you get uh, from that limiting process of the uh, proportion of the balls. Okay. And as you expect, it is the like likelihood, negative like likelihood, plus something related to the, um, the prior, right? This is defined by the um, given prior measure. Sorry, this E here has to be Z. I have called this subspace of X in the previous slide Z, so I mean Z here. Now, when uh, mu naught is Gaussian and um, your x is a Hilbert space, then this space z um, is the image of the space x under uh, this operator c naught the power of minus 1. Okay, so if if you don't know about this, this is just um, a very smoothing operator, and uh, which then implies that this would um, be much smoother than the space x. So any member of uh, x that you choose and you act this operator on it you would get a much smoother one. So it's like an, in, an integration um, happening. So let's say you have a non-differentiable function, you would integrate it twice, then uh, you get a, a, a twice more, a, a more smooth function out of it. So this is the sort of thing that is happening here. Okay, and then um, for a general space X, the space Z is the space of admissible shifts um, of mu. For the Hilbert case, this would be equal to this, but uh, in general, um, it's, uh, it's the closure of this in some appropriate space. Okay. Right. Um, so all I'm saying here is that what you know already for the final dimension case holds also for the function space case. If you choose this uh, 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 regularization term there, which is coming from the prior appropriate for the right norm, that is of course dictated by the prior. So we are saying that the modes of the posterior are characterized by the minimizers of this functional. Okay. Now this functional, when phi is locally Lipschitz, has a minimizer, um, locally Lipschitz unbounded below. Um, so the fact that phi is bounded below 
and then implies that there exists sequence un such that you would have a minimizer of i itself i of un converges to this minimizer a minimizer of i itself and then you 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 would use this local elliptic property of i to show that there exists some u bar such that i bar is equal to i evaluated at u bar okay which then implies that this is the um, uh, minimizer u bar is the minimizer okay right so now that we know that the mode can be characterized by that um, variation of formulation then we can see if they converge or not now we are outside sort of the uh, uh, bayesian setting because we are just concentrating on this variation of problem for this functional So let me remind you what the posterior consistency problem look, look like. So we have the uh, data being gathered, a lot of it. So n is large. This gives rise to this posterior mu. Okay. And then we are asking as n little n goes to infinity, are we uh, recovering the truth underneath or not? and we would like to do that through the mode so we would like to see that the modes of this uh, new um, y1 to yn converges to the truth as n is becoming larger now how do we calculate the modes of new y um, through this um, variation of formulation so this is negative like likelihood I have forgotten half here. And then this is the norm of the, the space of admissible shift, which comes from the prior. So that's how UN is defined. And we ask, does UN converges to um, the underlying tooth? Um, now, for phi local ellipses, in here, if we consider the Gaussian noise, this is um, equivalent to having G, the forward operator local ellipses. And if your truth lives in this smoother space Z, then um, Your forward operator applied to U n converges to your forward operator applied to U truth. Okay, and then if your G is injective, um, you would have the convergence of U n to the truth. We saw in that um, one-dimensional example at the start of the course that, of course, if your G is not injective and two points um, in a space are giving you exactly the same data, it would be unidentifiable anyway. You cannot identify between the two. If, you know, more than one point in X are giving you the same value. But if your G is injective, then as data is increasing you would recover the truth provided that the forward operator is local digits now if it's not injective then you can find subsequences which approach to one of these guys which give you the data We've got a question by Henry Luo in the chat. He says, uh, GU equals uh, U square is a situation where uh, G is not injective, which necessarily 
must cause bimodal in posterior, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So this is uh, in connection to your um, remark that we should uh, then work with subsequences. Exactly, that's that's correct. So you would have a subsequence which uh, which would converge to one of these two modes in the example that Henry is, is talking about. But yeah, we we wouldn't know which one of them is the truth. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, So notice that we are um, uh, making the assumption that the truth is in Z in that smooth, a smoother space. Under that condition, we can converge to it. If it is in X and not in Z, then, or we don't know if it's in Z, we can only then say that we can only conclude the first part, that G U N converges to G of U dagger. We cannot say. Um, anything about the convergence of the UN itself. But we know that what we are getting is converging to the image of the truth. Okay, so if there is any question about the consistency part in this, no time to ask. There's a question here in uh, my room, which yes. is going to be asked. Hey, excuse me, I have a question. Uh, for uh, the case where uh, G is not injective, uh, the convergence of the subsequent is toward uh, A DAG or uh, a, uh, a star? Oh, you are absolutely, thank you. That's, that's a good point. That's my mistake. That should be your star. Okay, thank you. you. Many thanks, yes. Yeah. Other questions? I may have a question in general uh, related to the nature of the PDE you, you're working with. So you, you, here, everything is uh, described for the example of the elliptic operator. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there, can we consider other types of uh, problems? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for asking this because I didn't realize that I kind of gave that impression. No, actually, these are the, from time to time, I go back to that example uh, to uh -huh. explain things, but actually, the the results are general. So as long as G is locally Lipschitz, um, you can apply this. It doesn't have to be that um, elliptic um, um, problem. Okay, but so, uh, so maybe it affects uh, also the rate of convergence maybe, the, the nature of the... Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So here, so when I, when I was, uh, uh, it's exactly that's true when we are talking about so uh, in the approximation case result i denoted the rate of convergence uh, uh, by psi of n so that is kind of my notation for some given rate of convergence which can be different from problem to problem for the elliptic one um, as we saw, it's kind of polynomial. It's n to the power of minus something. But for a different problem, it might be different. OK, I see. OK, thank you. Thank you. I think there are no further questions. So maybe we, we can continue mm -hmm. with the last part. Yes. OK, so now we are going to see a little bit the sampling. Um, uh, methods for approximating this, um, the integrals of different functions under the posterior, so calculating the expectations of different functions under the posterior.
Okay, so this is, um, so when we are in a function space, um, of course, then we need to, in practice, we need to discretize to go to a uh, finite dimension space to approximate these integrals, something that we can calculate. And um, when these uh, spaces are high dimensional, calculating these integrals directly um, is very hard. Um, so here the sampling techniques come in, which are kind of, um, they, are, they do better with uh, Monte Carlo sampling. They do better with, in, in large dimensions. Um, and then we are going to concentrate on Markov chain Monte Carlo. The idea here is that we are going to um, approximate mu by a sum of Dirac measures, which in essence mean means that when we are calculating the expectation of a function um, under mu, so expectation of f is just this integral, integral over x of f with respect to mu. We approximate this by the sum of, by the uh, equally weighted sum of um, the function f evaluated at endpoints. Right, so if we choose this endpoint um, appropriately, this uh, should give us a good approximation of the uh, expectation, this integral, this good approximation of this, um, the integral of it. Now in the Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, this UN is a Markov chain. Um, so I'm going to explain briefly how we construct this Markov chain so that um, uh, the approximation is good enough for this uh, expectation. But let me just briefly remind you with the definition of Markov chain and Markov um, kernel. So. Uh, the sequence UN is a Markov chain if the probability of going to the next state uh, does not depend on the previous states. So if you are at Vj minus one and you are going to Vj, the probability of landing at Vj is independent of all the previous states, V1 up to Vj minus two. It only depends on uh, the uh, right. And then the mark of kernel, uh, remember that is a measure that describes the distribution of this next state. So if you are at the moment at the state V, then the probability of landing in uh, a certain set, then um, is described by uh, Markov kernel. Now, what we do, uh, the, the idea of these methods, MCMC methods, is that we would like to construct a Markov kernel that is easy to sample from and has mu as its invariant distribution. And so normally, so we cannot just take mu itself. It's harder, it's, it's hard to sample from mu. Mu naught, for example, when it's Gaussian, something known, then you know how to sample from it. Usually that's the, uh, your your uh, kernel would incorporate that um, in itself, the, the fact that it's easy to sample from you know. 
but that from mu is difficult. That's why we are going through um, trying to find such a mark of kernel. So it's easy to sample from uh, P, that's our wish. And also we would like it to have mu as its invariant um, distribution. So that if you, this means uh, that if your uh, J's sample is distributed according to mu, then the next sample also will be distributed according to mu. And then we will draw, as we construct this P, we draw these samples from P. This would be our Markov chain. And this would give us the, the kind of the centers of those Dirac delta distributions, which uh, their uh, average would give me basically an approximation of the posterior. Now, um, now this is the formal definition of the uh, kernel P being invariant with respect to mu. So remember that was one of the uh, conditions we wish for P is in the invariant with respect to mu. The formal definition is this. And then one property of the Markov kernel, which would imply the invariance, is the detailed balance. So we say that a Markov kernel satisfy detailed balance with respect to mu if you have this condition. Masume, we, we've got uh, one question uh, by Nesrin Klebi in the, in the chat, uh, asking you to please explain why we can't sample from uh, mu. Uh, why is it unknown? And uh, what is an invariant distribution? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, um, the invariant distribution formally is a distribution which satisfies, uh, sorry, no, no, we are not talking about um, invariant distribution. We are saying that P is invariant with respect to mu, okay? So it means that if I have uj, sorry, I need to, uh, if I have uj distributed according to mu, the j's sample from p, okay? So we are sampling from p. If uj is uh, distributed according to mu, then uj plus one, the next sample from p is distributed according to mu. You, you see, you, we might not, we might not be, uh, so you want, when you are having your first sample, that might not be distributed with respect. It might be far or close to it, um, but it might not be distributed according to mu, right? Um, so that's why that then um, I write this more general um, definition here which then implies that if you land in there, you know, and something which is distributed with respect to mu, then you remain you know, for the next sample. Um, okay, and this is uh, something that helps us to find close, we are, we are, it's basically saying that the samples that, um, we are taking from P are close enough, are, are, are close enough, I, I, we don't know still if they're close enough, but they're they are close to, to mu. And if we keep sampling for a long time, they will end up um, as close as we like to mu. Okay. So that, would, that is what 
uh, it will imply, and that's why we would impose it on P. We construct our um, the, the sampling uh, algorithm in a way that it satisfies this property here. Okay. So this will ensure that if you keep sampling, you would end up closely uh, representing the measure mu. Um, yeah, so for, uh, to, for example, when you have a Gaussian uh, distribution, which is our situation here with, uh, with the prior, then there are, uh, there are different algorithms that allows you that allow you to sample from it but in this situation since you don't have that um, if you want to avoid also to calculate the uh, the uh, normalizing constant along the way um, uh, MCMCs are uh, one way to do that I hope I sort of answered the question. So I try to explain a little bit more along the way. Uh, Nesrin is answering something. Yeah. It seems it's clear. Okay. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so detailed balance. Um, so if you just integrate both sides of this, um, with respect to V, let's say, yeah. uh, both sides with respect to V, then, um, this side, mu du does not depend on v, so you can bring it out if this is with respect to v. Uh, so you would get the integral of p u d v, which is one, and then this equal to mu du is exactly what is the definition of the invariance here. So detailed balance is a stronger, it implies the invariance. So in the following, we impose detailed balance uh, to get the uh, P invariance with respect to me. Okay, um, so one way we can do that is through the metropolis hasting MCMC methods. And um, the way that uh, this algorithm does this is through the proposal, the proposal distribution Q and an accept reject procedure. Okay. So you choose your initial state from a space where mu lives on, charges with probability one. Okay. You choose the initial state from there. Then you propose from this proposal density. Now, this is something that is easy to sample from. Okay. So, for example, it can be mu not itself. Um, and then we impose an uh, accept reject probability to decide if we want to accept this proposal or not. Okay. So we accept with probability AK, AK defined like that, and we reject otherwise. 
we will put our next state you know, to be equal to plus one, and then we repeat again. Okay. Now, this is implying all of this together is implying uh, some transition kernel for uh, this. The samples that we end up having u1, u2, and so on. So let's try to calculate that. So we want to know, starting from u, what is the probability of landing in the set A? So if we accept and land, that would be the probability. The first part. So Q, we are proposing A, we accept. That's the probability of accepting and landing in A if we integrate together. Now, we might also, what, what else also contributes to this? If we don't accept, we reject, but we were already in A. Okay. So U, the starting point, was an A. And then it doesn't matter. Whatever we reject, it doesn't matter. And we reject the probability 1 minus A. Okay. So that these two parts are going to contribute to the resulting measure describing the transition kernel for this sample U here. Okay, um, now this then gives me the measure. If I only notice that, of course, this guy I can write as delta u dv over a, and then just swap the order of integration, then I end up having this expression for the uh, mark of kernel for the samples UK. Okay, so notice that we are sampling from Q, who our proposals, not sampling, our proposals are from Q, but through this accept reject, we kind of try to make these proposals close to the measure mu. And you will see that this accept reject uh, uh, procedure, of course, involves then the uh, likelihood, the identification of the uh, mu with respect to mu naught. Q involves mu naught. Okay. Um, Also, I maybe didn't mention it uh, that by reversible, I mean, uh, it, so when the Markov chain is reversible, it's equivalent to saying that uh, the kernel is uh, satisfying detailed balance. And remember that detailed balance implies invariance. Okay, now. We know that if Q is reversible with respect to mu naught, satisfies detailed balance, then P satisfies reverse uh, detailed balance. If the accept reject probability, the acceptance probability sorry, is defined like that. So here we are in the setting of the number again posterior having this um, uh, 
right and naked in the to be just put to e to the power of minus four. So we would like to have a proposal density um, reversible with respect to new naught. And then if we have that with this choice of the acceptance probability, we will end up having a, a Markov chain which has mu, the targeted measure, as its uh, invariant measure. So one obvious choice for Q is mu naught itself. So if you substitute mu naught here, this identity is satisfied um, trivially. So that you would have that, and therefore you would get your appropriate, your, your desired Markov chain out of the metropolis systems. things. This is the, what is called independent sampler. Now, if your prior is Gaussian, then this choice, this particular choice, we're going to talk a little bit more about it in a minute, will give the preconditioned prank nicholson method. So this is better um, when you have a phi, which is very, your data is very informative. Um, performs better than the independent sample. And this is what we're going to um, use um, tomorrow as well. OK, so as I told you, this the reversibility of Q equals mu naught is, is quite clear. Let's see why this guy is reversible with respect to mu naught. Okay. Um, so you notice that the product of mu du pu dv is a measure mu and the product of the space x by x. And what you would like to do for uh, detailed balance is showing that mu du dv equals mu dv du. And the way that we're going to do it, we're going to apply the Fourier transform to both sides and then and see that they are indeed equal. Um, so the Fourier transform different to the, applied to the measure uh, the definition is what you know from the normal uh, Fourier transform. Um, so it's the integral of e to the power of i. Um, here, the inner product of u and psi. If you have Hilbert space, if it's Banach space, then you have the function of psi applied to u, and then integrated with respect to mu. So if, it, if mu had a density, this was like calculating the Fourier transform of the density function with the normal uh, definition of the Fourier transform. And then we know that there is a one-to-one -one characterization between the Fourier, Fourier transform and the measure. Therefore, here, when we end up with an expression for the Fourier transform, which is symmetric in psi and eta, uh, then it immediately follows that these two measures are equal and therefore you have the detailed balance. So uh, don't worry about this expression. I'm just saying that applying the Fourier transform would, would give you this symmetric uh, expression for the Fourier transform. Uh, but this is a standard result which give, which tells you 
all I have used here is twice using the expression for the Fourier transform of the Gaussian, okay. which um, I mean you can show or look it up um, from different places. That's all has been used here. Okay, right. So you have the uh, detailed balance for this Q for the precondition Frank Nicholson. Um, and therefore, if we choose our acceptance, acceptance probability like this, um, it would give us a uh, Markov chain which has uh, mu as its invariant measure. Right, so again, I, I emphasize that when you are using this uh, MCMC methods, then you don't have to. So of course, remember that that's what mu, uh, that's how mu is defined. Um, so if you wanted to sample from mu naught and use these weights to construct mu, then you had to also calculate Z. Uh, you had to um, estimate the normalizing factor here, as you can see, you don't need to do that. So you get away with that. Um, and what else I want to say uh, here, uh, I wanna also mention that this beta is a parameter which controls the degree of locality of proposals. Okay. So you see, the smaller it is, you would be closer to the previous, to the to the current um, sa uh, current sample. Um, so normally. You can choose it a bit larger until you land uh, in a place that you, your target measure has a bit higher probability. And then from there, then you can reduce it to search locally for your best, uh, you know, for, for better search of that area where, where uh, um, mu has more probability. Okay, so you have some control on how you are searching the space using this beta. With the other example that we saw here, uh, the independent sampler, you don't have that. Okay. Um, are there any questions? I was wondering something which is maybe very, very naive, but uh, I, I'm really not familiar with uh, MCMC methods, but uh, your explanation has uh, made me think of um, some algorithms for gradient flow minimization. And the question was if we could somehow understand this algorithm of some sort of uh, gradient flow minimization. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I... So, yeah, you are saying that uh, we are kind of uh, trying to go towards the direction that phi is maximized using sort of the, de the derivatives of, of phi. Is that what you are? Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. We, we, we want are... to... To maximize uh, something over yeah. a density. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I think you are right. As you can see, also, you see, we are at each stage, you are calculating that. If um, uh, phi of uk is 
bigger than phi of vk. Uh, then uh, exactly. So this is the negative like 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 likelihood. Um, then you are accepting the probability one. Okay, so you are very much uh, biased towards going and finding the, the towards the mode, sort of. Okay, yeah, so it looks so. <laughs> uh, Fabio has a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's a comment on uh, Olga's uh, question. I mean, in, in the two algorithms that you have proposed and this algorithm here, precognition at Frank Nicholson, you're not using any gradient information on phi, but, uh, but you could, right? There are versions of the MALA algorithm where you add also gradient information that I think is, goes very much in uh, Olga's direction. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fabio, that's, that's correct. There are, there are actually, uh, yeah, exactly. There are methods that are uh, explicitly uh, including that, yeah. Thanks, Masume. I, I think uh, I think we don't have other questions. There is something. Uh... Uh, we don't we don't have other questions. Uh, thank you, Masume. <laughs> no, no, no. That that's okay. No, I, actually, somebody is, is, has written something there. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I missed that. No, no, uh, Luo was asking that. Uh, gradient methods would only sample uh, the map and uh, break the detailed balance equation. So all samples are near the map? Uh, no, because you know, when even when you are smaller here, when you are smaller than, uh, uh, that's why that you have the opportunity, even if this guy is less than one, you know, you, you there is, a, you can still uh, choose to go there, right? Because it's only in probability. Uh, um, Fabio would like to comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I mean, in, in the gradient version that I was mentioning, you still randomize the, the, the gradient descent. So you do one step in the gradient descent plus the random uh, the Gaussian perturbations. So under certain condition, you can still guarantee that you sample the right uh, posterior. So you don't converge to the map, but you sample the whole posterior distribution. Mm -hmm. right. and, uh, and usually, I mean, uh, if you do the time continuous gradient flow, you would sample exactly, but uh, then it's not practical. You discrete as in time, you have an error, but with this acceptance rejection criterion, you correct it. So you end up having the right distribution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, no, I don't. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we can continue, Masume. Okay, sure. Right. Uh, yeah, so um, related to that, uh, uh, oh yeah, I want to make another comment here before going there. So this is uh, kind of defining this for X, any Banach space. However, of course, for calculating any of these in practice, you need to discretize. Okay. And uh, what you are doing, you are approximating that finite dimensional measure new n that we talked about. So we are um, approximating the uh, li uh, likelihood uh, as a result of uh, approximating the underlying forward operator. If we do it in a right way, um, consistent with the way we have defined prior, then we end up with the final dimensional measure 
one uh, finite dimensional sort of space, um, approximating new okay, um, on that on that sort of space, the rest remains as the prior. So what we are doing in these algorithms, they are we are trying to sample from new n. Um, okay, which, if you remember, was that uh, approximation of new. All right. Now, um, as it was also mentioned uh, before, of course, this is the, the examples are not uh, are trying to closely follow mu, but they are not uh, samples from mu exactly or from mu n in this case. But there are conditions, as also uh, Fabio was mentioning, which ensure that you converge to, to this measure if you sample for a large um, 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 uh, number of times. Okay? So if you, the density, uh, the proposal density is positive everywhere, uh, then for, and for all in you, then you would have that, you would have uh, the case sample, so PK is, you start from U1, PK is the measure of, uh, the measure that you get, you would get over the space after the case, uh, uh, K number of sam uh, sampling, repeating the procedure. This would uh, approach to uh, the measure that you're trying to sample from. Okay, and then remember also that we have obtained the similar uh, results for the connection between the true measure mu uh, and its finite dimensional approximation in terms of the Hellinger distance as well. So putting these two together then it tells us that we can uh, uh, approximate expectations of different functions on the mu um, um, with expectations um, under this um, uh, measure mu n, which here, of course, I, mean, I don't mean this, I mean the, uh, uh, the version that we get from the MCMC. Okay, so putting this together, the version that we get from MCMC as the approximation of new, new n then is a good approximation of the original expectation that we were after. Okay. So if there is no question, I think I am at the summary. So I'm gonna... Um, um, I'm, I'm going to summarize and then um, ask for questions and then I'm going to give you um, what some um, explanation of the problem that we're going to look at um, tomorrow in the um, practical session. Okay, so what we did uh, was looking at the well posedness of the uh, Bayesian inverse flow problems for functions. Um, so we looked at the conditions which give us the well-definedness of the posterior and its stability in data. And then uh, seeing what we need for this, we looked at the ways that we can construct the priors on the function space in which our unknown lives. Then we looked at the effect of the approximation of forward map on the posterior, because we always need to discretize anyway when we have PDEs underneath. Um, and then this also, if done appropriately, results in final dimensional approximation of the posterior. Um, we also looked at the weak consistency um, of the posterior, by which we mean the convergence of the mode to the truth under appropriate conditions. Uh, we did this for, for 
Gaussian measures, but can be done for um, different measures, uh, for best of measures that we looked at, for uniform measures. Um, also, this can be uh, generalized to that. And also, we saw the metropolis hasting uh, Markov chain Mon Monte Carlo methods briefly. Uh, uh, and uh, so the, of course, PCN algorithm. Uh, again, of course, I explained the PCN algorithm for the uh, Gaussian measures, but uh, there are the, as the prior, there are the whitened versions that you can use, for example, if there are best of measures. Um, so you, this step doesn't change, but then you uh, incorporate uh, the transformation between Gaussian and Bessel in here in the uh, acceptance probability. Okay, is there any questions at this point? I think Rilua is uh, typing a question. Are there questions uh, from any of the rooms? Fabio has a question. Yeah, I had a small question on your result on um, consistency of the and the convergence of the map estimator. Um, I don't know if you can put the theorem uh, on who was way back. Um, so in the case where you don't have injectivity, you said you can find a subsequence that is converging. I was wondering, uh, do, do you have some compactness to, to be able to extract subsequences or is that a totally different argument? Uh, no, I think you, you need that. Uh, uh, you know what? The, the, uh, you are right, but you know this Z is uh, is compact in X. Okay, so it's, it's always compactly in back then. Exactly. So somehow okay. I know what you mean because you need that if you want to. So it's sort of implied because you have the the norm of uh, the norm in Z of U N bounded. Mm -hmm. which is a awesome. compact subspace of X. Okay, yeah. thank, you. thank you. Okay, thanks Fabio. Uh, there are no further questions. Uh, Henry, Henry Luo was... Uh, ah, okay, no. So, no, there's, there are no further questions. Uh, Maybe you wanted to say a few words about uh, the computer hands-on of tomorrow? Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to just um, motivate tomorrow a little bit. Okay. Um, so we are going to, so we talked about that elliptic uh, problem a lot. Um, so what we are going to do tomorrow, we are going to consider the one dimensional um, case of that elliptic problem. So it's the same PDE, it's just that your X is in um, uh, the interval between zero and one. Then um, we have the right-hand side one here. Um, uh, F is equal to one. And then these are the boundary data. Okay. And then now we are measuring P at some point inside this interval. We have noise involved and we would like to estimate U. Okay. 
So I suppose that you live in this space, so you are in C1. And of course, as you remember, we would, we would like the infimum of uh, the function u is always away from zero. Keep the ellipticity, of course. Also, it showed itself in our Lipschitz estimates for p, so we wanted it to be bounded from below. So we would like to do that. Also, notice that we are considering here one which is strictly positive and therefore then implies that this operator G is injective. So um, if we have enough data, we are sure that we're gonna recover, uh, we're gonna recover something close to the truth if we have enough data. Um, so that is, as I said, for N, if you have F and F is, um, strictly positive is uh, correct, this injectivity, we are going to consider a constant one. Uh, right. Mm, okay, so we have already seen how we construct uh, the radon nickel derivative of mu with respect to mu naught, and we would uh, uh, have this uh, well defined if mu naught of x equals one. Remember that I have uh, considered x to be this space. So C1 functions and away from zero everywhere in the interval zero to one. And we are going to define our mu naught through this expression. So we first form this sum using the Fourier basis, sine cosine Fourier basis over the interval. Okay. And we choose our um, um, decreasing sequence so that we ensure that we land in C1. Okay. And then we also apply this G exponential function to make this positive. Then the mu naught that we get out of this is going to live on the space x that we are after. And then we apply this PCN algorithm to uh, sample from this, measure, and uh, for some um, underlying function, and observe that how far we are, we are recovering it. Uh, and then you can also experiment a little bit with uh, the draws from the prior um, and see how it looks like um, with the prior experiment a little bit with the, um, uh, the uh, proposal a step beta that we were talking about in the PCN algorithm as well. That is what we will do then. And uh, that's it from me if there is no question. Thanks a lot, Masume. I, I think there are no further questions, so tomorrow we, we will program uh, all this. Okay. As far as I understand, uh, we will program everything from scratch and uh, everyone will use its favorite uh, language or oh really okay um, i didn't okay i see uh, sure. uh mm, of course yeah that would be that would be absolutely uh, possible uh, uh, you you had uh, you had thought of a jupyter notebook uh, yes, I had thought of uh, Jupyter note notebook. Yes, uh, ah, yes. We, have it, we have it. We have it in Jupyter uh, not notebook. Uh, okay, yeah. perfect. This uh, was a uh, uh, mistake on my side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's uh, yeah. We have it. On. Oh, I see. You were asking what we are going to do. No, it, actually, the code is is there, so they can experiment with it if they want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, but I don't know what 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 was supposed to be done. I think one hour and a half maybe it's not enough to write the whole thing. So, 
it's just there and they can experiment with it or change here and there if they like um, yes so okay. it will be explained tomorrow different parts of the code and yeah that's it. yeah okay excellent um okay um so we are uh, done for today so thanks again masume thank you yeah.